How much do you think that Bitcoin is political? That's a good question. I mean, how much is any technology political, right? I mean, it certainly has political implications, but I don't think kind of the technology itself is what it is. And I think of it as being very apolitical. Um, I think it appeals to people with certain political bents, right? If you're suspicious of your government, or if you live in a country where it's screwing up your currency, then you're going to be a lot more interested in, in, in Bitcoin. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here and, and note that uh, you know, Bitcoin, like, like any money, needs people to use it and needs people to want it. It is as successful as, as the number of people who are willing to, to put their faith in it. And, and I, I frankly think that uh, the politics of, of, of Bitcoin, and, and you can read that narrowly as you know, libertarian politics, but I think you can also read it much more broadly, have been incredibly important in making people willing to take this leap and say, okay, I'm going to start doing something with this. I'm going to start dedicating some time to it. And uh, not to put you on the spot, but you're, you, you, you had these, these common politics, Gavin, with a lot of the other people at that time. I mean, I don't think you were as, as um, sort of a avidly, actively libertarian as a lot of other people. I call myself mostly libertarian. Mostly so. libertarian, okay. So that's a <laughs> nice wishy-washy way to... But I think, that, uh, I think that a lot of people early on... I, I, I think that Bitcoin wouldn't have made it through its first three, four years if people hadn't cared passionately about it. Um, and, and Gavin's one of the people who cared passionately about it. And it, it would have just died a quiet death, and it, and it could have died a quiet death many different times. And it was the people who cared about it. And uh, I mean, that, that was really what got me animated about this story, was realizing how deeply people did care about this software that, that doesn't even exist in the real world. And, and that, that was kind of what I needed to understand, but I think also, to, to get back to your question, that level of passion does go back in some level to politics. It's not necessarily just as crudely, crude as, you know, libertarians liked it, but it appealed to, to people, this idea of a money that could do this new thing. And, you know, right now, money is something that governments issue, so there was kind of going to have to be some politics in there somewhere. There's, there's another political force, uh, I think, that, that we need to uh, focus on a little bit too, uh, which Gavin mentioned earlier, which is uh, people who believe in the internet. Uh, and I'm one of those people. I, I believe that the architecture of the internet is at the core of its power, uh, this network that nobody controls, that uh, anybody can attach a server to and become a participant in the network and that uh, nobody can revoke that permission. Now, governments have tried to change that over time, but mostly have been unsuccessful. And Bitcoin is the exact same architecture uh, in the sense that it is a highly distributed, uh, open source system that no one entity has any control over. And, um, and, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a set of politics around that that are not libertarian. They sound libertarian, but it's just people who are technologists and entrepreneurs and developers understand how important a system like that is. And there really hasn't been systems like that before. If you wanted to build a cable channel, you had to go pay John Malone 30% of your company in equity just to get him to put your, your cable channel on his network. If you wanted to print a newspaper, you had to be able to afford a printing press. So you know, the stakes to play the game until now were so high. And now the internet and Bitcoin and hopefully many other technologies which will follow, which will use this architecture, are, you know, they're permissionless and, and they're open and they, they're the greatest platform for innovation that's ever existed. So that, that politics is not, you know, traditional kind of politics, it's techno-politics. Okay, so those are the, that's the, the virtue of it is the, distribu the distributed nature of it, the governless approach, well, it's if you will. It is governed. The thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is that if 51% of the of the nodes on the network uh, decide that they want to adopt a different uh, version, then that new version becomes the new uh, 
uh, version. Kind of, sort of. Okay, correct me on this because I want to get it right. <laughs> but it, it's, it's complicated because, I mean, if you create some Bitcoin that, you know, not everybody agrees are valid Bitcoin, it really is important, like, who agrees that those are valid Bitcoin, right? If, if you're trying to spend them at a store and the store says, eh, -eh those, that's an invalid transaction, it doesn't matter if you've got 51% of the network if you know, none of the merchants will accept it or if none of the Bitcoin exchanges will exchange it for dollars. Right. And so there really is kind of this interwoven ecosystem of the people who are mining, the people who are exchanging Bitcoins. People who are operating the nodes. People operating the well, nodes. Can we just go backwards for one second? How is it possible that I could have the equivalent of what might be described as fake Bitcoin if I go to a, how is it possible that one store is going to accept my Bitcoin, my one version of Bitcoin? Are there more than one version of Bitcoin? There are actually uh, several hundred altcoins. <laughs> well, which, which you can think of as like people who say, I don't like Bitcoin, I'm going to create my own blockchain. I'm going to take the source code, I'm going to change it in an incompatible way, and I'm going to create Gavin coin. I actually haven't created Gavin coin. That'd be a terrible idea. Um, and, you know, most of these aren't worth anything because they have no community behind them. Um, but, I mean, yeah, that's how you get a, 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 a you know, dig another digital currency that... There, there is, though, uh, it, there are many altcoins, but there is, you know, one... One Bitcoin. One, one Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And there, there is a, a test, essentially a test network Bitcoin... That is essentially Gavin coin. That's true. I did. That is a place where you can kind of play with it if you don't want to. It's a sandbox. Um, yeah. Um, Designed to be worthless. Right. I, but I don't know if it, it might be helpful to sort of think about uh, the the you, that that look on your face. I yeah. feel like we need a. <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah. But 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 this notion of a Bitcoin and, and people sort of being behind something and 51%. I, we may have skipped a, yeah. a, few, a few steps ahead and maybe uh, taking it back to, to one particular moment that I think is interesting, which, which uh, was this, this thing called the, the hard fork, which uh, could, could happen any time in Bitcoin, which is that you have everybody going along, running their software, doing transactions, making new Bitcoins, and everybody has their version of this spreadsheet that I mentioned. They have it on their computers, and everybody's sort of more or less checking across, okay, yeah, we all have the same version of the spreadsheet. We all know you have this much, you have this much. We're all in agreement. And, um, and at one point in 2013, people had sort of feared that this would happen. Um, suddenly, a group of people was over here saying, okay, we've, we're creating these new coins, and they're assigned to this person. And there were a bunch of computers saying, oh, we're creating new coins, and they're assigned to somebody else. And so there was a disagreement. And so in that moment, the, these, the Bitcoin forked, and there were essentially two versions of Bitcoin. And, and what you had in that, that moment was this question of, okay, who's in charge here? You know, is it the guys over here who are making the coins and assigning them to them, or is it the guys over here who are making them and assigning them to them? And it's actually quite a dramatic moment, if I may say so myself. And I, I, was, uh, I was very impressed at your description in the book. Why, well, thank you, Gavin. Um, because Gavin, it was very accurate and... Uh, and hopefully comprehensible even to, to, to people who, who wouldn't necessarily understand it. But, but one of the interesting things, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up, one of the interesting things that happened there was that Gavin is the, the sort of lead programmer for this software. And, and in that moment, Gavin made a suggestion that, you know what, let's all do this and all download this software. And he's in charge, right? But actually, the people who were running the network said no. We don't want to do that. We're going to all do this. And um, they basically developed a consensus and said, we're going to go this way, and this is going to be the official Bitcoin, and we're just going to leave this runt over here to die. And, and they moved on. And, and it was this kind of fascinating moment in who's in charge, and can there be more than one Bitcoin? So you know, for there for 10 hours, there were sort of two Bitcoins, and everybody was kind of watching and panicking and thinking this is the end of it, because if there's two of them, uh, the whole thing's kind of not worth very much. Um, and, you know, again, it goes back to this question, who was in charge? It was the people who were running the computers that day.